What's up, nerds? Boy, it's been a while. Too long, really. There's not really a reason for that. I just haven't done anything recently I thought was super interesting. It's all been more baseline interesting. Except for this. I recently changed text editors and if you're a software developer, you know how important your text editor is. It's how you express all of your stuff goes through your text editor. It's like a canvas and brushes to an artist or an instrument to a musician. It's extremely important. So I, I'm fascinated by people's development environment and their, their tools of choice. So this is a little bit about the text editor I'm using right now which I admit is not the most exciting thing, especially since this text editor is like 26 or so years old. But I was really surprised at how good this is going. A couple things happen contemporaneously, which I'm almost certain is a word. First, my work machine, uh, it has a problem, and that problem is four gigabytes of RAM. It's a Surface Pro 3, which is a nice piece of hardware, but it's not a higher end one. And after some Windows updates, I can either run Chrome or Visual Studio Code, but running both at the same time is not great. I start swapping really quick and that's no good. Too slow. And I'd already gone from Atom to Visual Studio Code really just for that reason, because Visual Studio Code is a bit leaner and a bit quicker than Atom. But I'm running into this problem again, and it's no good. About that same time, I went through my semi-annual screw the world, I'm going with Vim, which hits me about every six months or so, and generally lasts about 10 minutes. I'll pull up a file in Vim, I realize I don't know how to exit Vim. I will hit a bunch of keys and have my file disappear. And then I'll decide, you know what? Maybe mice aren't the worst thing in the world after all. And I'll go back to what I was doing. This time, I decided smart people use Vim. It's something like the third most popular text editor, according to Stack Overflow. I'm not a smart person, but I can fake it. So I'll fake it for a week and see how it goes. And I've been using Vim ever since as my primary development environment, my primary text editor. And it has been awesome. And there were advantages to it that I really hadn't thought of when I started using it. Now, first advantage is I don't have to run Vim on the machine I'm on. At home, I've got this beefy 6-core, 12-thread, 32 gigabytes of RAM monster. And it's running OpenSSH server. So I can just run all of my development stuff over SSH there. And I can poke a hole out through my firewall for whatever uh, Webpack server or browser sync for that port. And I can see the updates on a browser on my local machine but I'm running all my development stuff on my monster at home. That means I can run it on my Surface Pro. It doesn't take any RAM. I can run it on my Chromebook using the secure shell extension and everything works perfectly. So it basically means I can run a really lightweight client to do very serious-ish development work using Vim. The second thing that was really great about it uh, is and it doesn't sound like it would be great. On most IDEs or text editors, it has a shallow but brief learning curve. What I mean by that is you can learn what you're gonna learn how to use your text editor pretty quickly, but then it stops and you're never gonna get more productive with that text editor. You're just gonna baseline there. With Vim, the learning curve is very steep, but it goes on for a very long time. And after a couple of weeks of using it, I'm already probably on par with the speed I was in my old text editors, but I'm just gonna keep getting faster and faster as I learn more stuff, because Vim is 
<laughs> it's like the Photoshop of text editors. It's bottomless. So I keep learning new stuff and I keep getting faster and faster with Vim. Now Vim isn't the only thing I started using. So when I got into Vim, I got into something called Tmux. And Tmux is a way to divide your terminal into little virtual windows that you can use to run different stuff and also saves your session so you can come back to it. When you're working remotely, that's important. If, if your Wi-Fi drops out, you don't just want to lose all your stuff. With Tmux, you can just reattach to that session and get back to what you're doing. So all that works, and I'm on my machine right now, but normally if I'm off, away from my machine, I'll just SSH into it. Look, I exited Vim. Let's see, I've got a little script, and this is in some dot files I've shared on GitHub. Uh, 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 and it's just a little tiny shell script that basically you, and I have a alias for it that's just dev. So I can say dev geoportal. It'll look and see if that session exists. If it does, it'll connect me to it. If it doesn't, it'll create it with two windows, which is how I like my uh, dev sessions to look like. So I can go dev geoportal and it's connecting me to the session I already had running with, with two windows. I've made the font here much bigger than I'd usually keep it. So from here, I can just go npm start. It can start up my stuff. It can start browser sync and it's gonna launch this. And it's gonna start this browser sync on a port that I have poked out through my firewall so I can pull up the site running in a browser from wherever I am. And on Vim, I have some ex extensions installed. It's doing some on-the-fly linting. You can see it's saying I have a problem here. Missing semicolon. Does all that kind of happy stuff. It's linting JavaScript and CSS and, and some other things. So let me just drop out of here. Now I can detach from this. So whenever I want on a different machine at a different time, I can just go right back into it and go right back to that section. That session. Go ahead and close out of browser sync and detach. So that's how I manage ses sessions and, and getting to different stuff. For Vim itself, I don't have a whole lot of plugins running right now. And that's a... Uh, Unusual. When I look at most people's uh, Vim RC files, it's a little off-putting because they'll have like 80 plugins running. And I don't see how in the world anyone can store all of Vim shortcuts and 80 plugin shortcuts in their brains at the same time. What I have running is a theme, Dracula, which I kind of like. Uh, an extension for Vue.js so it does proper highlighting. Ale is my on the fly linter and it is asynchronous it requires vim version 8 emmet for quick emmet stuff for writing i've got vim pencil on goyo which is like a minimal writing environment and wordy so it can check for stuff like weasel words and crap Nerd Tree is like a little file browser plugin. I, I very rarely find myself using it unless I'm on a project I haven't been on in so long I can't remember where stuff is. Uh, NeoComplete does code completion. It's also asynchronous, or it can be. Vim Airline is an, this nice status bar you see down here. Fugitive does get stuff, and Prettier does some uh, basically prettying up your files. And Prettier is kind of nice. It's a bit nicer than your normal beautifier. You can give it exactly what you want and it'll style it uh, pretty up accordingly. It's especially helpful when you have a project with more than one person editing it. It can keep everything 
the the styling of it the same for everybody in your project which is very nice so well, that's about it. All these, uh, my dot files are on GitHub. I'll put a link to it. Uh, yeah, that's about it. The only things I would say are if your <coughs> excuse me, distribution isn't on Vim 8, you should find a way to make it Vim 8 because it is a really big upgrade in particular, it does the asynchronous stuff, which so, so you can run stuff without locking up the main thread, which is was one of the really nice things about NeoVim. You can have that in regular Vim now. Well, that's about it. I've been super happy with Vim. If you've tried it before and it just drives you nuts, I totally understand. It's been driving me nuts every six months for like 20 years now. But... If you have time, uh, just use it exclusively for a week or so and get the shortcuts under your fingers. I think you'll find it's really kind of awesome. I would also say two other things. If you're running, want to run uh, OpenSSH server at home, uh, there's a service called duckdns.org, which is like a free DNS, dynamic DNS service, so you can always get back to your local machine. And if you don't have a Linux machine at home to run OpenSSH for a, a central point of contact, you can use a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi is a $35 ARM computer, about the size of a credit card. And I'm holding one right now, you can't see it, with a super nice case. And my super nice, I mean, is like $15. That and a SIM uh, SD card was like maybe 60, 70 bucks. And it's a fully working Linux machine computer. I have Arch on here, OpenSSH server, and my dot .files, my development environment. And it I could I could use this if I wanted as my main central repo to SSH and to and do my work. I will say if you're doing like C compilation stuff, like you're installing image optim in Node, and it has to compile like GIF sickle and all that stuff, not the fastest thing in the world. It is a thirty-five dollar computer, but for just general day in day out kind of work. Uh, it's it's plenty fast enough for web development. So that's an option if you don't have a Linux machine at home you can run this stuff on. Anyway, if you found that interesting, I will probably be posting soon with some, uh, hopefully not all ranting about Webpack, because Webpack drives me a little bit crazy, but it's kind of the thing now, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get into it. Anyway, I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.